welcoming here, Lord Jesus. First John 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I thank you, Lord, for that. That you don't just say that we're condemned, but you give us a way, Lord, to call upon you, Lord. We, we can draw near to you because of the blood of Christ, God. And if we, if, we, if we have any sin in our hearts, God, I pray that you'd show us. And I pray that we wouldn't be too ashamed to admit it to you, God. We would just admit our sin to you, God. Please forgive us, Lord, if there's any sin in our hearts. We pray to you this morning.
everybody follow that, and maybe I'll just share it tonight. I just thank God for his blood. I thank God for this church. Um, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may be also glorified together. And um, I did have something to say, but I think I'll share it tonight. Um, like the pastor said, this is for believers. If you don't know you're a believer, you can know the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit. If you don't know that today, you can know it today. And so, Father, I just thank you for your blood, Lord. Just like we just sang about it. Lord, you brought every mountain low and every valley up, Lord. You cleared the path and made a way for us to come to you, Father. I just praise you and I thank you, Lord. Wash us clean, God. If there's any among us that doesn't know, Father, I pray that you convict them, Lord. That they would cry out to you, Lord, with hand, Lord. That they'd be born again here this morning. That they'd be able to partake in this communion, Lord. We thank you that this isn't magic, God. It's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a, it's a call to obedience, Lord. And we just praise you for the ability to put it into remembrance at the forefront of our minds what you've done for us on the cross, God. And we just thank you this morning. In Jesus' name.
tempts us, we can remind him and remind ourselves we have a strong and perfect plea. The sinner's perfect plea is the blood of Jesus. And we flee to him as a refuge for our souls. I'm just so thankful to the Lord, not only for saving me the day that I gave my life to Christ, but saving me and keeping me every day. He's able to uphold us and keep us. And I just want to worship the Lord this morning. Chapter 7, 
so you all had a chance to find it. It's on page nine of the Bible. My Bible. Uh, Micah chapter seven. We're going to start reading in verse seven. We'll read through verse nine. Micah says, "Therefore, I will look unto unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise." When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord, because I have sinned against him, until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Amen. Everything about what Micah is saying here is one of hope, is one of something of expectation of the future. Even though he says, I've sinned against the Lord, when he's speaking or in declaring his faith in God, and he's declaring a hope in the Lord. And I'm going to tell you this is a very simple message. I'll tell you right off the bat. You won't, I don't believe you'll be confused as to what we're talking about and have a hard time following anything. It's simply this. We're going to use this as our text for Micah. What he says specifically in verse 7, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And I will say this to you this morning. God wants you to hear that God's people are to have confidence to wait on the Lord. We're to have confidence in the faithfulness of God and confidence to look unto the Lord. And then as we're looking to wait on the Lord, we're to have confidence in the Lord and trust in the Lord to do that because he is a faithful God. And we are to greatly trust the Lord, and we are to completely trust in the Lord. Now, I've said this before because I've thought about the Bible talks a lot about waiting, and waiting is one of the hardest things to do. Waiting is hard for an unbeliever. It's hard for a believer. It can be hard, but we have a big difference between us and an unbeliever. We have a steadfast confidence and hope and assurance that our, my God will hear me, and my God will deliver me. Okay, and do the work that needs to be done. Sometimes, you know, you can wait just because you don't have any choice. You, you, you know, so if a child's waiting there, they're all enough to get a driver's license or a teenager. There's no choice. You just have to wait. You're in the doctor's office. We have some doctors here. Uh, you just have to wait. You don't have a choice, right? There's a lot of things we just, you're stuck in traffic going to the beach and you're stuck on I-10 right before you get to the tunnel. Comes to a screeching halt. And you want to get to the beach, and you don't have a choice. There's not 15 different ways. You pretty much have to go that way, right? Sometimes we wait. We just have to wait. Well, Christians have to wait, too. But the difference is when we wait, we need to, God wants us to wait with a confidence in Him. He wants us to wait with a peace in our hearts and in our minds and in the faithfulness of God, trusting Him. God wants us to trust Him greatly, and He wants us to trust Him completely. And so the Lord is speaking to us this morning. The Lord wants you to trust Him. The Lord wants you to trust Him right now. He wants you to trust Him in whatever circumstance or situation you are in at the present. Some of you, I know some trials you're going through, some I do not, but the Lord knows. He wants you to trust Him. He's telling you this morning, He wants you to trust in Him and be still and wait. And He wants you to wait and, and in turn while you're waiting to have the faith of God and the peace of God. And He has given us the basis upon which we can do that and how we can do that. The basis is the unfailing love of God for us. The unfailing love of God and the faithfulness of God that he has shown us through the years. That is my basis. That is my basis that I can say like Micah, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. He says in verse 7 of what we read, God's people are not simply to, to wish and hope. We're to, we're to hope. We're to trust in hope. And, you know, every, every believer, and I don't think there's any exception, you read about famous men and uh, characters in the Bible, every 
man of God, woman of God, young person of God, to some point in our lives, probably more than once in our lives, we're brought to a crisis point. We're brought to a crisis of our own faith in God. Am I going to continue to trust Him for, for this? And you fill in the blank of what this is. You know, we've got all had ups and downs in, in our, you know, we doubt and then we believe and then we, God forgive me for doubting and we're up and down a lot of times and then we're strengthened in our faith and praise God for that. But everybody I believe comes to some point where there is almost a crisis of their faith. Where are, am I going to, to turn to the Lord and trust Him despite the delay and the answer? Despite in the severity of the trial, the length of the trial, the deep depth of the valley I'm going through, uh, despite how it seems that heaven is shut up and God is not hearing me, I have all the promises and yet none of it seems to be working out for me. And God allows us, can I tell you that he allows you and I to go right to that point? It's not a mistake, it's not an accident, it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing, but it's a growth, and it is a death to self, and it is trusting in Christ, and we are brought through those. The Lord is the one who keeps us from falling. You know, I read the Bible about uh, the last letter that Paul wrote before he was martyred for Christ, and he writes that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. That always sticks out to me because he didn't just forsake Paul. He evidently forsook the Lord in exchange for a love for this present world. That some he had walked along in the Christian mode, maybe for years. We read in other epistles that he was one of the fellow laborers. He's mentioned as one of the laborers of, of the Lord in the gospel and the New Testament. But he came to some point where he loved the world more. But I think for, for us, there are trials of our faith in summer, some we, we get through pretty quickly and it was nothing but a off on the, on the road, and others are serious, and others are, we're, we're agonizing, and yet God is upholding us. Unto him who is able to keep you from falling, the Lord keeps us in the faith. A lot of other things may be stripped away, but he is able to keep us in the faith, and I promise you that's where you want to be. That's where you need to be, and where I need to be. So things come against us. I'll tell you what Jeremiah said, the weeping prophet, right? He wrote 50 something chapters plus lamentation. He didn't have any followers. He didn't have any uh, real companions. There was one servant that was with him for a, for a while. He, pre he preached the truth of, of Jehovah as God told him, and he was rejected, and the Lord's word was rejected, and he was thrown in prison at least twice. There was all kinds of things that happened to Jeremiah. He says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. I mean, you just get this picture that, you know, everything we hoped for is past. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. Basically, we're still not saved. We're still not saved from our own sin, from the enemy, whatever. Uh, he, he had his own personal enemies and so forth. Now, Jeremiah continued to trust the Lord. I'm simply giving you an example of that crisis of faith where we're brought to, it is, it is within the will of God. It is within the confines of His what He has mapped out for your life. I'm not talking about trials we go through because of our sin, consequences, and we repent and come back. I'm talking about when we're, for the most part, we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and we're walking the Lord, and he, he allows us to go through something, and we're not seeing God move. We're not seeing an answer. We're not seeing deliverance. Or we're not seeing direction or wisdom or healing or whatever it may be. God, Micah says, I'm going to look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. We need to know that. We need to trust and believe that. And so God's people are not simply to wish, and you know how I'm using that wish and hope, with our fingers crossed that God will come through, that God will hear and help. His people are to know and to be sure that God will help. Jesus' own disciples who, who watched him in miracles and they were sent out and even came back and said, Lord, the devils are subject to us in your name. I mean, it was amazing the power of God he had given them. 
And yet, when they were on that boat at night, and Jesus was sleeping in the bottom of the boat, and the waves are coming, the storm's coming, these grown men, several of them fishermen, who probably spent their lives on the sea, were scared and thinking we're going to die. And he rebukes the winds and the waves, and then he rebukes them and says, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? The just shall live by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They haven't come to pass yet, and yet we can trust that they're going to come to pass if God has spoken it to our hearts or spoken it clearly in his word. And so when, when Jesus at one point had 70 disciples and more than just the 12, and he, he preached a sermon, said some things that they, they were offended in John chapter 6, and they left and says they walked no more with him. So he turns to the twelve and said, Will you go away also? And Peter says, and we know that the passage, Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And he says, We believe and are sure. That's what we're talking about this morning. We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It comes down to that. Can anything shake your faith and get you off of that firm foundation? No, Lord, no matter what happened, I, I, I pray to be healed and I got sicker. You know, I pray for this and my family to be reconciled and the, the division got wider. But we come to a point to say, I believe and am sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he wants us to be able to trust him and stay there. There is a world of difference between our God and every other God with the little G that's out there. A world of difference between our God and every other God that is worshipped by men. And there is also a world of difference between you and I wishing and hoping that God will come through and knowing that our God will come through. There's a big difference. There's a big difference between I cross my fingers, so to speak, and I'm throwing this prayer up and I hope God answers it. I, I, I really need him to. I really hope God comes through. And yet the Bible tells us that, that we are to know with the steadfast conviction and assurance and unwavering confidence that our God will hear me, that my God is going to come through, that my God will deliver me, heal me, forgive me, whatever is needed in my life. There's a big difference between wishing and hoping, okay, and knowing that God will come through. That word hope, you know, the Bible speaks of Abraham. God promised an old man, he was 75, when the promise that he would be the father of many nations, okay? And he didn't have any children, and his wife was barren. She was 65 when the promise was made. He was 100 and his wife 90 when the promise was fulfilled. We know this story, but the Bible says in, in Romans that against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, as it is written, so shall I see be. There was a promise made, excuse me, <clears throat> from God. And the promise from God is as good as the God who made the promise. And he wants us to know that. And he wants us to believe that. And so the Bible says in Hebrews that Sarah herself received strength to conceive after she was past age, because she judged him faithful who promised. It wasn't the promise as so much as the one who made the promise. Whatever the promise had been from Almighty God to Sarah and to Abraham, she came to a point, they had their doubts and unbeliefs as well. But I always say from the beginning of the promise to the end, they got there. They got where they needed to go. God kept them and they trusted God. And by faith, Abraham, the Bible says. And by faith, Sarah. Amen. And so uh, that hope is not wishing hope. Okay, I say it all the time, I use sports for an example. You, you, you're watching your favorite team. I hope my team wins. Guess what? They don't always do that. That's why it's so exciting when they finally do win. Uh, they don't always win. You hope so. It's an excitement. You want that to happen. That is not the same as biblical hope. Biblical hope, when Abraham believed, hope against hope, basically. That word means a joyful expectation. Or it means to an expectation with pleasure. In other words, I'm really trusting and believing, and I'm believing for good. I'm believing the Lord for good. So it's a trust in the Lord, and it's not just wishing, crossing your fingers, 
and hoping your team wins, right? Our, our confidence in the Lord is not to be a wish and hope, but to trust. To trust. And he wants us to stay right there. And again, he's given us the basis for that. Why should I? If I meet some stranger and they say, trust me with your life. I'm like, I don't even know you. I'm not going to trust you with my life. But we come, it comes through knowing the Lord. It comes through the faithfulness of God. Faithful is he who calleth thee, who also will do it. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, he abideth faithful. But nevertheless, the foundation of God standing, uh, have this seal, stand sure, having this seal, that God knows them that are his. And it says that he abides faithful. He abideth faithful. And so the more we come to know the Lord, you know, somebody might really ask, can I really, you know, you Christians talk so much about the word of God, we throw a scripture on everything. Can I really, can a, one, can an individual actually take the word of God or a promise from the Lord and bank on it, so to speak? Really put your whole self on the weight of your whole self or life or future or family? Can you really base it and rest it there on the promise of God? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. We have a hard time learning that. And that's why we go through repeated trials of our faith to show the faithfulness of God. Abraham and Sarah had trials of their faith. They failed a few times, notably. But they got where they were going and their faith was strengthened in the Lord. But yes, the, the, the way that we can trust the promise of God. I'll give an example. Uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is it really that easy? You know, if we believe, confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, and Jesus Christ will be saved. Or uh, when we pray according to his will, we know that he hears us. These are promises of God, right? If he hears us, we know that we have the petition that we desire to have. Are given and shall be given unto you. Uh, all these promises of God, right? That we're two again in my name, two or more, there I am in the midst of them. Can I really believe that and stand on it? The answer is yes. With a resounding yes, not because I say so, but because God has proven himself. What we come to know, an individual man or woman, we come to know the God of the promise. Know him. And when I know the God of the promise, the Bible says God who cannot lie. Another scripture says it's impossible for God to lie. So we come to know that God who cannot lie, and then when he speaks something, whether it's in the Bible or speaks something to your own heart, we can trust him and believe him. We can bank on that. We can rest in that. We can stay right there, amen? So uh, there's no power in simply wishing and hoping. Honestly, I said, there's a big, there's a world of difference between wishing and hoping that God's gonna hear and save and deliver or knowing, despite what I see, knowing that my God's going to hear me and answer. There's a big difference. God wants us to know and be sure. The first, just simply wishing, I think it's actually no better than superstition. It's almost like I'm going to try this. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to pray that scripture. I'm going to try it for a week and see what happens. And it's almost just like a superstition. If that doesn't work, then you try something else. God doesn't want us to say, if that doesn't work, try something else. He says, I'm gonna, he wants us to live and die right there on the promises of God. Somebody's praying for healing. You know what? You might die before you're healed. But you're going to be healed. Stay right there in Christ. You're going to get a new body and so am I one day. It doesn't get sick or hurt. We stay right there on the promises of God. We don't give it a shot. There were seven sons of a, in Ephesus, of a Jewish priest, uh, seven sons of a man named Sceva. We know the story in, in Ephesus. And they, there was a revival in Ephesus through the preaching of the gospel and the signs and wonders following and people being saved. And they went and burned all their ma magic uh, witchcraft and their books and piled it up in the street and said, we're following Jesus. And there were seven sons of Sceva. And it says, they tried to cast out demons like Paul did. There was a man, one man, in a house. It was demon-possessed. And they said, we adjure you 
That means to solemnly charge. That's not the same as that confidence of knowing that Paul had. Okay? We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Speaking of the demons, come out of that man. And the demon, the man who knew the demons were, spoke to these seven men and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? I want to live honestly to where God would be. The devils would know. The devils would know where Cornerstone Church is. The devils would know where you are when you're out and about in your daily lives. Not just at BBS or we'll go out street medicine, but the, 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 the hell would notice where we are. And we would walk with that confidence and that power. And then the man in whom the evil spirits were, one man, left upon those seven men overcame them. They ran out of the house that says naked and defeated and everybody knew about it. God was glorified. What's the point? One, the seven sons of Sceva wished and hoped and gave it a shot. Let's, try, let's see Paul doing this. Let me try that and give it a shot. That's not how he wants us to live our lives. He wants us to know and be confident and trust in the Lord. There's no power in such a life of just hoping and wishing and there's no peace in that life. There's no strength because that strength comes from the Lord. Remember, Peter said, when the other disciples left, we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Evidently, those others hoped and thought that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Maybe they did for a good period of time, maybe for a year and a half. I don't know. But they trusted, trusted up until a point, and then they quit God wants us to be like Peter. We believe and are sure. Despite what I see with my eyes and hear with my ears and what I see in the environment, morally and spiritually around me or in my own circumstances, I know that you're God. There's a wonderful scripture. It's become one of my favorites. And I'll just quote it to you. You know it. Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen will be exalted in the earth. He is going to be exalted. We heard about this morning in Sunday school, a wonderful lesson from Psalm 8 that, that Fed taught this morning about uh, what is man that thou art even mindful of him. And yet, he's going to be exalted. And he wants us to be still and know that he's God. He wants to, if the Bible says, strengthen us, establish us, set of us. Not still in the sense of uh, lazy, but still in the sense of being settled and, and waiting. Okay, that word still, be still and know, I looked it up, and it does mean just to cease, to cease from your labor. <clears throat> you don't serve God anymore, it means whatever I'm fretting over and trying to come up with an answer, I'm trying this scripture, I'm trying God for a while, okay, God's not going to answer, Abraham and Sarah, well, hey, uh, Abraham, take my, my handmaid and go into her and have a child. Maybe that's what God means. They're, they're not being still and knowing that God is God. They're trying something out. They're not settled. They're, they're giving something a shot. Let's just try this maybe. God doesn't want us to be maybe when it comes to the things of, of God. The things he has clearly shown us in his word and spoken to our hearts. And specifically who he is and his character and his faithfulness. When he comes back, you know I say it all the time, when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, in Revelation 19 on a white horse, we're, we're going to be following him. He's, he's coming to do what he's coming to do. Amen? And, and on his name, his name is written faithful and true. Faithful and true. That's who he is. That's not going to change. It doesn't change because you haven't seen or I haven't seen God answer a prayer in a long time that I've been praying for. Does it change because I'm going through a trial that's way harder or way longer than I ever thought I could go through? He is still faithful and true. And he's faithful to you when you're going through it. He's faithful to me as well. Be still and know. Any man of any religion can practice his religion and then hope for the best. Anybody can do that. Anybody, pick it. You know, pick a, pick a religion and they can follow.
follow their practices of their religion, and then they can hope it works out for them, or their God will hear them or help them. But only God is our rock. Only Jesus Christ is faithful and true. He alone can be trusted, and he alone should be trusted. We should trust him. It doesn't honor God when we doubt and when we, we are unsure about the goodness of God and so forth. There's no solid footing for the man who simply hopes. I'm just and I'm not talking about biblical hope, I'm just wishing hope. Gosh, hope it happens. I tried this. There's no solid footing for that. James says, when, when he's using a, uh, wisdom in this case, but he says, if any man lacks wisdom, what should he do? Ask of God, which give it to all men liberally and upbraided not, and shall be given to him, but let him ask how. In faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's not wishing and hoping when I stand on the promise of God. Lord, you said in your word, and we stand right there. It's not wishing and hoping. We stand there, and we stand there, and we continue to stand there by the grace of God. He keeps us, and he holds us up. He keeps us from falling. I always thought that was interesting, at least to me, in that passage I just quoted from James about the, uh, this man is unstable, the man who wavers when he doubts, when he prays, and he he doesn't pray by faith. He prays, but he doesn't pray by faith and he wavers in believing. Uh, it says he's not just unstable when it comes to his prayer life. He's not just unstable when it comes to receiving wisdom, and that was in the context of what the prayer was for. The, the man who wavers and doubts when he prays, he's praying the right prayer. He's praying to God, and yet he's doubting that it's actually going to come to pass and God's going to hear him. That man's unstable in all of his ways. That makes for an unstable person. Not just in my prayer life, but in everything. I'm going to be doubting, wondering, and wishing, and hoping, and oh, it didn't work out. I'm going to try something else. Abraham and Sarah didn't stay in perpetual doubt. They had some times they doubted, and they took matters in their own hand. They sinned. It was wrong. They came back to God. And they, they continued to trust the Lord. They ended up, as I said, in faith and where God wanted them to be. There's a little story I heard uh, about it. There was two friends, two young girls, uh, that were saving up to buy something they really wanted. Each of them was saving money and doing little odd jobs and trying to save money to buy what they each really wanted. They were sitting there one day counting their money and counting out pennies and nickels and so forth. And this little girl says, I got this much. And this one says, well, uh, this one got about five dollars. This one counted out about five dollars. But this one over here said, "I've got, I get ten dollars." She said, "No, you just counted. You only have five. She says, "No, I got ten dollars." They argue back and forth. There's only five dollars there. She says, "I got ten dollars." Dad, when he left this morning, said when he gets home, he's giving me five dollars. I got ten dollars, and it's just the, the fact of counting on it to that extent. You only had five sitting there. And who was it? Uh, Hudson Taylor. It said we got 25 cents in all the promises of God. You know, we've got 25 cents left in the mission field in China, but we got all the promises of God. It's trusting in the Lord, being still and knowing that He's God. So I want to talk about Micah just as we, we bring this on. Uh, if you're still there in Micah chapter 7, there are some, read with me, we're going to back up to verse 2. So here's Micah saying, talking to the Lord, he says, woe is me in verse 1, and he's verse 2, the good man is perished out of the earth, there is none upright among men, they are all lie in wait for blood, they hunt every man his brother with a net. Skip down to verse 4, the best of them, as is a briar, Skip down to verse 5. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not, no, not confidence in a guide, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the, the daughter rises up against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and man's enemies are the men of his own house. So then the next verse is where we open the 
this morning. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. Okay? So I want to talk about this just for a moment. Michael was going through trials. There were two main things that we read about. Number one, there was wicked, untrustworthy, deceitful people all around him. He says, you better close your mouth. Don't even talk to your wife that's laying there next to you in the bed. You know I mean, when people are betraying each other left and right. This was the best of them. Is what he said. The best of them is a uh, good man's perish from the land, or the best of them is a briar. Okay, they'll poke you. So he's 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 facing unfaithful, beyond unfaithful, enemy, deceitful, hateful people around him and close to him. He's facing it himself. He's got another trial or circumstance or situation where he, which he needs God. And that is in verse 9. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. So he had his own sin. He had his own sin. The, the point I want to make from this is that for both of those outside trial, trials and things that are without, unfaithful people and enemies that want to get me, that's all around. I also have my own sin within. Okay? For both of those, he says, I'm looking to the Lord. I know it's a simple truth, but we can look to the Lord yes. for everything. Inward things, uh, I don't have any peace and I worry all the time. And, uh, I own sin and I struggle with this and I, my mind races on me. And uh, all these things, we can, we can bring that to God and he's the answer. And we can say, I got, I got backstabbers all around me at work, you know, around my own family or whatever. And I got government that I don't trust or whatever. I got this all around me. We can turn to God for everything. We can turn to the Lord for everything. My God's going to help, Psalmist said, and he, he will help in that right early. Amen. He's going to help. And so turn, turn to the Lord for everything and turn to the Lord alone. Don't turn to God plus some other stuff. Turn to the Lord. Learn to turn to the Lord for everything, the smallest little thing, right? Little sniffles of whatever. Just turn to the Lord for the smallest thing and the biggest thing, but also turn to Him alone and turn to Him with your whole heart. Don't turn to Him halfway, that's what I'm saying. The unstable man, right? It wavers and prays without faith. He needs wisdom. He's asking God for wisdom, but he doesn't fully believe, he's not fully convinced that God is either able or that he'll do it for me. And that would be us, right? I don't believe, I believe God can do it. More than more along the lines when I doubt, it's not doubting at all that God can do it. It's you doubting, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it for me? I read about him doing it for other people. Is he going to do that for our country? Is he going to do it for me? And so forth. But God wants us to not turn to him. Don't turn to the Lord halfway. Don't turn to the Lord slightly. Don't turn to the Lord somewhat. Okay? Don't turn to the Lord when, when you yourself are unconvinced or unsure of his absolute goodness. Of his absolute power and mercy and his desire to help. And to forgive sins if that's the case. Turn to the rock of your salvation and fall upon that rock and stay right there. You'll never be disappointed. Amen. You'll never be let down. You won't be left on your own. He promises, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So in the darkest trial you're going through, when you can't literally see the hand in front of your face, and you don't even know what, I don't even know what to do, God. I don't even know which way to turn. God has not left you. He's right there. He wants you to call upon the rock, fall upon the rock. Uh, the Bible says, uh, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn. That's where we turn. He's telling us where to look. Mike is telling us where to look. Mike is telling us where he did look. Where other men and women have turned to God in the past. I'm going to bring this to a close. Jesus went into a house house and two blind men followed the Lord in the house and when he was coming to the house of course the blind men wanted to receive their sight they heard Jesus doing miracles the blind men 
came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. He asked them a question before he did anything. Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched ye their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. It's important that we believe, and it's when, when we don't believe, or when we struggle, or when we waver, which we all do at times, it's important that we come and allow God to strengthen our faith by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's not a catchy slogan. It's not simply even just a, a, a verse to memorize. It is a truth that faith comes to the individual heart and life by the Word of God. Hearing it, reading it to ourselves, walking in it. So Micah has this problem. He's got strong enemies all around that are deceitful, and he's got his own sin, and he turns to the Lord. Amen? He turns to the Lord. He trusts God. I'm going to wait. I'm going to read towards, uh, look at verse 9 again. He says, I will bear the indignation. Now, he's, Micah, this godly prophet, says, I'm going to bear the wrath of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until, see, there's hope here. I'm just going to bear continual wrath until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Even for sin, I could say especially for sin, right? God is faithful. He's faithful. He says, I'm going to bear his wrath. I've sinned against the Lord. I'm going to bear the wrath, but he's going to plead my cause. You know, what, you know what Jesus has done for us? Isn't that our Savior and Lord? We took communion this morning. Isn't that what we have in Christ as an advocate, as a mediator who, who stands in the gap and on our behalf and pleads our cause? We sin against God, and the same God that we sin against is the one that pleads our cause. It's really amazing, the mercy of the Lord. Who do we sin against? I sin against God. I have sinned against God. Who is going to forgive me, that same God? Who's going to plead my cause like a, a mediator or an attorney that's on my side, beseeching on my behalf for my pardon? Jesus. The same one I sinned against is going to plead my cause. He's going to bring me forth and set me in the light of the Lord. I'm not going to stay in darkness. I'm not going to stay bearing the wrath of God because of my sin. And I, it's coming against me because I have sin, but God's pleading my cause. And he's standing in the gap. Little children, these things write unto you that they sin not. If any man sin, John said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. I'm going to bring this to a close. Like it says, he's going to bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. We see this in men of God and women of God when we read in the Bible. You know what Job said? Now, Job, we don't read of any particular sin that caused the calamities that came upon his life. We see that God allowed Satan this much and then stopped him. It's a lot. What he allowed was a lot, but he stopped him short of taking his life. Okay? God allowed it. He put a hedge and said, you're not coming any further, Satan. But he didn't understand what he was going through. And with all the questions and all the things that Job did not know, read the book. Read the book. He had counselors that they didn't have a clue either. They thought they knew what they were talking about. They weren't speaking on behalf of God. They said some truths, but they weren't speaking the truth to Job. And so he comes to a point and he says, you know what? I don't know a lot of things. I don't know why this has happened to me. My own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he says this, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And then he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He knew a lot for someone way back then that didn't have all the Bible. My Redeemer lives. I have a Redeemer who's going to buy me and purchase me. Okay? And he is going to stand. And he was a he too. And he's going to stand upon this earth in the latter day. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. You know what Micah said? I'm going to see him. I've sinned against him, but he's going to plead my cause and bring me out. And I'm going to behold his righteousness, like I said. Whom I shall see for myself, Job said. My eyes shall behold and not another. And I just see this. God
God wants us to trust like that. We're brought to, that was a crisis of faith for Job. There's no doubt about it. A lot of things you can blame for the book of Job. But for the man personally, it was a crisis of faith. And this was his profession. This was his profession. I know my Redeemer lives. I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him for myself. Even after this body is destroyed in a grave somewhere. This is what Micah is saying. This is what Job is saying. And y'all, you can come. This is what the Holy Ghost is saying to us this morning. I said at the beginning, it's a simple message. He wants us to trust. He wants us to be still and know. And he wants you. You can go and stand with me with this morning. God doesn't want us to wish and hope. God wants us to be still and know. Wishing and hoping, he wants us to, instead, he wants us to be still and know. And we stand upon a rock and we fall upon our rock and we fall upon our rock. David said, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. I mean, you just boil it right down to the closest people to you. On the, on the time when they gave birth to you. When my mother and father forsake me, the Lord's going to take me up. He's got me. He's got it. God wants us to boil it down to the most simple things. The altars are open. Don't turn to the Lord halfway. Know that the God of your salvation is going to hear you. The altar's open. Come and call upon the Lord. Call upon your rock here at this altar. But thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. And quietness and confidence shall be your strength. God wants us to come to Him with confidence to rest upon Him, to wait upon Him. Father, we call upon you this morning, Lord. You are our rock. You are the firm foundation of our lives and souls. And Lord, we turn to you. And God, we don't want to turn to you halfway. We want to turn to you with full assurance and confidence like my God. I will look unto the Lord. My God will hear me. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that you plead our cause. I thank you that you're our advocate. I pray you would strengthen our faith to believe. And to trust you.